Nancy Caruso is my hero because she has single-handedly led the attack, if you want to call it an attack, on restoring the kelp to our oceans. And the kelp, of course, is the place where the sea life thrives, and we see it every day. 95% depleted when she started, and now it's like a giant garden out in the ocean. Not only has she done that, but she's inspired a whole community of people with her kelp fest to follow her and get involved with her and participate in this process. And last but absolutely not least, she has gone into inner city schools and she's had these young people who probably have never seen the ocean, raising kelp and abalone and sea bass and coming back to the ocean to release them. And what an inspiration she's been, not only for the ocean, but for the future of the custodians of the ocean. Thank you, Nancy Caruso. My name is Nancy Caruso. I'm a marine biologist and the founder and executive director of Get Inspired. Get Inspired is a nonprofit organization dedicated to inspiring passion and purpose through the discovery of arts and sciences. Get Inspired has a program called the Orange County Ocean Restoration Project. That project was started in 2002 in an effort to restore the kelp forests of Orange County. The kelp forests disappeared about 30 years ago and not many people noticed it because they're invisible, they're underwater. So you could drive down to the beach and it would look just like it did 30 years ago, except there wasn't any kelp underwater. Not many people get the chance to go under there and see what it looks like, but it really does look like a forest when it's nice and healthy. The kelp is also actually in thousands of products that we as consumers use on a daily basis. So things you probably would never have thought of, um, like stuffed olives or band-aids or Mrs. Fields apple pies, Mrs. Fields cookies, McDonald's apple pies, blueberry waffles, diet salad dressing, cream puffs, Alginate actually is the compound that's extracted from the kelp. Alginate is used to uh, thicken and make things creamy and smooth. And so imagine, um, if you will, if you've ever made a glass of chocolate milk at home and you use this, either the powder or the syrup and you pour a big, tall, cold glass of, of milk and then you pour your syrup or your powder in there and you stir it up and it's nice and chocolatey and then the phone rings. So you walk away from the chocolate milk and come back 15 minutes later Chocolate's on the bottom of the glass, right? Well, have you ever bought a chocolate milk from school or from 7-Eleven and you open it up, you don't have to shake it. The chocolate never separates from the milk. Do you know why? Algae. So we got all these people together who cared and, and they were empowered to restore it, grow it again in their classrooms. The kids were growing little tiny microscopic spores of, of algae and they got excited that it was being planted in the ocean. The volunteers were out there monitoring it, making sure it was growing and planting it just in the right spots. And over a period of about 10 years, we were able to bring the kelp forest back. And that's important because over 800 different species rely on them. So lobsters and abalone and sheephead and kelp bass and halibut and snails and all of the things that we think of when we think of life off of our coast, they all rely on those kelp forests. They're considered the rainforests of the sea. So we were able to restore those with the help of all those people and all of them took ownership in the kelp to the point where they'd come and ask, how's our kelp doing? And I got to say, it's doing great. So Kelpfest was started in 2009 and it came out of a need to kind of explain to the community that they now have a kelp forest to take care of and to love. And um, the kelp had come back and it was starting to flourish and people were, were talking about it. You could go places and hear, oh have you seen the kelp? But there was also kelp washing up on the beaches because that's natural. As the kelp, uh, actually each frond of the kelp lives for only about four to six months and it breaks off and floats off into the ocean and it's responsible for carrying the reproductive spores with it to spread around the ocean, but it also washes it up on the beach and that's a whole other ecosystem called kelp rack. The people uh, who live along the coast actually started to complain. There's kelp on the beaches and there hasn't been kelp here for 30 years. And so I started pulling pictures from the 1800s and early 1900s and showing people what the beaches are supposed to look like, but it wasn't helping. So the Kelp Fest was born and now it's blossomed into a musical event and um, 2,000 participants, um, arts and crafts and public art projects and invite artists. One of the big things with Kelp Fest is to, to have people get have an appreciation for kelp, we've got to show them what it looks like. And again, not everybody goes underwater. So we 
display it visually as many different ways as we possibly can. There'll be all different types of, of visualizations for people to connect to the kelp. And then they'll also have a chance to eat it and paint it and draw it themselves. So hopefully they walk away that day saying, hey, that kelp stuff, that's not that bad. And it's actually kind of pretty. That's the goal of the kelp fest. So after the restoration of the kelp forest, we started thinking about, well, what else needs help uh, in our local waters? So uh, we came up with green abalone and white sea bass, both of which were dwindling, the numbers were dwindling, and the green abalone is on its way to being endangered. Baby abalone, when they're born, are actually planktonic, meaning they float in the ocean on the surface currents, and they're microscopic, you can't even see them. So when the students get them in their classrooms, we actually have nurseries in the classrooms, and they hold about 23 gallons of water, and they are, right now they're getting abalone that are about three years old. So they come from local farms, and they're about this big, and the students, now they have eyes, they can make contact with them and look at them, they name them and put little beads on them to identify them, we measure them, and of course feed them. There's actually a Facebook page for green abalone. <laughs> We're watching to see if our restoration takes, if it's successful, and if it is, then it's a recipe for restoration of the species up and down the coast. Not everybody knows that there's lots of art in science. It takes a lot of creativity to do what we're doing because no one's ever done it before. The white sea bass uh, was a commercially and, in, and recreationally very important species in Southern California. Uh, they get to about five feet long and about 90 pounds. The numbers of those species were also dwindling and the Department of Fish and Wildlife is a partner with Get Inspired on all these projects. And we also partner with uh, Hub Sea World Research Institute on the white sea bass project. So they spawn them in their tanks down there and then they give us the little babies and the students up here in Orange County take care of them and raise them. They grow very fast. They can grow about three to four inches in, in uh, about four or five months. And so the students are taking care of the tank, making the seawater, testing the chemistry daily, and of course feeding them as much as they'll eat. And we can release them in the ocean. They don't become dinner for another type of fish. Uh, but we've actually taken students underwater with the fish to release them in the kelp forest. Students have got scuba certified. They swim over and hide in the kelp, like just like they're supposed to. There's absolutely nothing like a crystal clear day underwater with bright shining sun coming through the canopy of the kelp where it looks like a stained glass window and makes the light dance on the bottom of the ocean floor. And you can just lay upside down and watch it dance. It's beautiful, there's nothing like it.